Lovely to be here. Um, I seem to be uh, blamed for the cold weather, but praised for the sunshine. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, you, you guys live in a really nice part of the world, you know. <laughs> I don't think you guys appreciate that as much as you should. Look out there at where we're staying, look it out and you could see the bush and see the sunshine. And as we drove up, we pulled in at uh, Waipu Cove and I had a walk along the beach there and I thought, you know, why wouldn't a man live in this part of the world? So, uh, yeah, it's good to be good to be here and uh, good to be here on a Sabbath to be able to worship with you. Just wanted to bring you a little, before I start the sermon proper, uh, a little bit about Longburn Adventist College. Um, there's our head boy, head girl for this year, Jordan and, and Rion, who are lovely kids. And put that one in for Jim Pram. I thought he might remember that building. The old building has obviously been gone for a few years. Who else is here re either stay? Yes, Mr Greenfield. There's a few people remember and had a part in the old, uh, the old building. Uh, the cafeteria is sort of on most of that site now. And I put that one in, that was the building of the, that was in the late 1950s that the building was the part of our current classroom block, block. We had a good earthquake January, just a few days before school was to start. And uh, there was a, a crack, with, a bit of stuff came down. I had to get, actually had to get an engineer and we couldn't figure it out. It wasn't until one of the original architects to the additions to this building came along and sorted it out. And uh, the engineer says, no. He says, I don't think this, that building's ever going to fall down. He says, rock solid. So we were talking about foundations. And he said, that one really is. Just a little bit about how, you know, I just bamboozled you with numbers here. No. Um, our NCA results, I just wanted, some of our kids are doing incredibly well. Most of them are doing really well. We're a, what's called a decile six school there, you know, and just comparing us with how we compare with the rest of the country, the national averages are up there. So they now put out the results on participation, how many actually go and sit the exams, and then roll base, which is on how many you actually had in that class, because so not all of them end up sitting. And so you can see for level one, that's the old, you know, the old currency, school certificate, you know that. Um, school certificate, uh, level one, NCA, level two, etc. Level three is the old form seven. And you could see participation back, back, that's the national average, according to students on the roll. And you can see that it gets down to about 57. I, we're, de as I say, decile six, very middle of the road school. Um, just based on your socioeconomic, um, where your parents, what they earn and all that sort of thing. And you can see there's our role-based, uh, participation-based results, and there's our role-based. So our role-based numbers are much nearer our participation-based, and I'm very pleased. So you really need to compare these red figures. And you can see that our students do, do really well. But what really excites me is retention rates. How many of we do you keep who come back? Typical in a state school, about uh, two, about a third, of, you know, who, a third of those who were who in year eleven leave, and uh, some of them are even higher than that, you know. So we, every school has some leaving during the time and some arriving during the time. We've had retention rates of 105 percent. You ask me, how can you retain 105 percent of your students? It's because you actually get a few more who have arrived. So every, every school's in that situation. So ours is near about 100 percent. So when you look at those figures, I'm very, very proud of how our kids are doing. And they are, I'm just delighted um, that they want to do some well. I thought, but I don't know whether Tony remembers uh, Reuben. Reuben Gray. No, he doesn't remember Reuben. Reuben was, if he, one of, one of our students quite a few years ago, and I think it's a fairly typical story. Reuben got through, he got his NCA level three, he got his university entrance, and then he went out and he didn't actually go into study immediately, but his ambition is he wanted to be a pilot. He was, that was his passion, he wanted to fly. So he went out and he actually worked at the airport behind the counter and I'd go out there and I'd run into Reuben. Oh, I see Mark nodding his head knows Reuben. I'd run into Reuben and uh, always a delight to see him. 
and Reuben would go and take flying lessons with the monies that he earned, and then eventually he actually became a flying instructor at Tainui Airfield, uh, deputy head flying instructor there. Then I came across Reuben and he's dressed up in that uniform. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm flying for Air New Zealand. So there's Reuben now look in the cockpit of one of these planes and I just thought, it, it gives you a warm feeling inside when you see kids who have a goal and an ambition and they end up achieving it. They don't always do it straight after they leave school. Some of them go out, and we've got a teacher at the moment, I taught her, she went and did two years at Rebel Sports, and then she said, I think I, I, think I need to go and do some more training. She went and did a degree in history, and now she's coming uh, teaching history and classics and English at college, and I'm delighted to have her there. And uh, I thought there was another one I was going, no. So this morning, and thanks for the children's story, I, I love that. Uh, I had visions of Dr Barry Hill and I writing on the whiteboard earlier this year at college where I had, who knows Barry Hill, be one of our directors for a long, I handed him, I thought it was a whiteboard pen, it wasn't, it was a vivid, and his mortification as he, we just, and my concern is we realised we had put everything up on the board and it was not going to come off. We did use the same trick, <laughs> it does work. <laughs> just want to think about grace this morning. What is grace? How can we apply it to our lives? How can we live lives that are filled with grace? And I just want to start by introducing you to Fiorelli, Henry Lagardia. There he is. All five foot three of them. He was the mayor of New York, 1934 to 1945. I put the picture of him with the policeman in there so you get an idea, he wasn't a very big man. Very, very well loved. They called him, his nickname, the Little Flower, because he usually wore a carnation in his lapel. And uh, the people of New York loved their mayor. He uh, used to go out riding on the fire trucks to see what the firemen were doing. When there was a newspaper strike, he went on the radio and used to read all the news out on the radio so people knew what was happening. He was known to take entire orphanages out to the baseball and take them in there because they didn't get to go out, they didn't have the money. And uh, he, he, was, he had an incredible reputation. In January 1935, uh, he ended up in a room like this. This is a night court in the United States, in, in uh, New York. So many people, a lot of crime to be dealt with, that what they do is, if, a lot of it is goes through the night court. So you might have your case heard at 11 o'clock at night uh, in an attempt to try and get through. So Fiorelli turned up at the night court, one of the night courts in New York, and he relieved the magistrate, and he says, it's all right, I'll sit in here tonight and I'll look after the cases that come up before the court. And the first case was a, a grandmother. She was a grandmother, she had two grandchildren. Her daughter was an alcoholic and she was trying to provide for these two young children. Remember 1935, January, cold, depression days, not much money around and she was brought in for stealing a loaf of bread. And Fiorelli looked over and he saw the shopkeeper who was pressing charges and he said, do you really want to press charges? And the guy said, yes, I, I do. It's a hard neighbourhood that we live in and if I don't press charges and prosecute, others are going to do the same. And, I, and she need, we need an example made of her. So Fiorelli looked at the lady and he says, well, are you guilty or not guilty? And she said, well, I am guilty. He says, well, therefore, I've got to find you guilty then. And the fine is either $10 or 10 days in jail. And as he said that, his hat that had been sitting there on the bench, he picked it up and he put the $10 in the hat and then he handed it to the policeman who was there and he says, and I want you to go I'm going to fine everybody in this court 50 cents for allowing this to happen 
in our city. So he went round, he collected 50 cents off everybody, including himself, <laughs> and including 50 cents off the sh ungracious shopkeeper. And when they totaled it up, there was $47.50 in the hat. And so he gave it to the lady and dismissed her. <laughs> and said, there you go. End of case. Case dismissed. And I thought when I read that story, I thought that was an amazing story of grace. It sums up what grace is about. Grace is when we aren't treated as the law demands. We are treated, we are forgiven, even though they had done nothing at all to earn or deserve that forgiveness. This was just a couple of years ago. I put it in. New York police officer Lawrence DiPrimo giving a new pair of shoes. This is, um, he was an alcoholic on the streets of New York a couple of years ago. Cold again, it was in the middle of winter. He'd just gone into a shop just behind there, you can see the shoes. And he bought a hundred dollar pair of boots, He's, you can just make them out down by his knees there, and gave it to this homeless man. What he didn't know is that a lady was standing there and she took a photo with her phone and the story went around the world. The, the thing is, grace is received, not earned. The, there's nothing we can do to earn God's grace. We sometimes think there are things we can do to earn God's grace, and sometimes we work hard to try and receive God's grace. But we get it no matter what we have done or what we do. It's just a matter of our acceptance. It's a free gift. And Paul says in Ephesians here, you know, let us praise God for his glorious grace, for the free gift he gave us in his dear son. For by the blood of Christ we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven, how great is the grace of God. And when you think of grace, it's, it's an amazing word, you know, we get, uh, that's it there in the, in the Greek above it, charis. We get our word charismatic from the word grace, charisma. And in the original, it is actually a really lovely word. You could describe a beautiful vase in the ancient world as having grace because of its beauty. Grace was a thing of beauty. If you go back to the root meaning in the, in the Hebrew, it actually is the word used to stoop down and pick something up. And I think we've lost that And really, you know, isn't that what God has done for us? Grace involves his stooping down to pick us up in this old world when we're steeped in sin, when we have none, done absolutely nothing to deserve that favour. So that's grace. We access it by our faith, and it's extended to us if we want to accept it. God, God doesn't force his grace on us. He never forces anything on us. But he makes the offer, and it's up to you and it's up to me as to whether we accept it. You know, in the New Testament, Paul uses this word a lot. I've discovered there's 101 uses of the word grace in the Bible. Of the 101, 66 are used by Paul. He experienced God's grace, and he came to use the word again and again and again because he knew what it was for grace to be extended to him, a sinner. This, this man, uh, Brennan Manning, he, he, uh, he wrote a book, if you ever get to read it, it's well worth reading, called The Ragamuffin Gospel. And he says that it was written for those who are, the gospel was written for those who are beat up, bedraggled. It's for those who are sick and tired of religion that only pays lip service grace. It's a book about the gracious and mind blown and the bit on the bottom that you probably can't see, it says acceptance in God, that we have in God. And a very interesting man. Brendan Manning became, he came from New York. His mother had been an orphan, orphaned when her two parents died during the 1918 flu epidemic. Irish Catholic origins, <laughs> lived on the streets of New York. Mum brought up in an orphanage, 
and she never really accepted him. He was the second son. She wanted a daughter, and when she got a son second time round, she made it very well known to Brennan that he wasn't wanted. And uh, he was told how useless he was, how hopeless he was, and he never knew how to get around that. His father was an alcoholic, nearly always out of a job, always out looking for work, but never able to find work. And the only, only relationship he had with his father is when his father would come home and beat him up. Anyway, Brennan did his best. He said he just made the decision that he was going to be a good boy, try and be good. He tried to do the right things that he thought a young Catholic boy should do. But he never, he never found that acceptance in God. He went off to the uh, Korean War, fought in Korea, came back. And then after he came back, he started a very promising career as a sports journalist. And then it was at that stage he was converted and he actually became a Catholic priest, a Franciscan. And he thought that was the right thing to do. This is the way I can please God. Sounds very much like Martin Luther, doesn't it? This is, this is the right thing to do. But he says as he had a very long, interesting career. And then he says as he began to re read the book of Romans and the book of Galatians, he realised that there was really nothing he could do to earn God's favour. And eventually he actually married, <laughs> which didn't endear him to the Catholic Church. And uh, he became what he called a ragamuffin evangelist, preaching the grace of God wherever he could. He only died last year, and I don't know how many people Brendan Manning would have preached to. Uh, he fought alcoholism for most of his own life. An incredible character. But a guy that came to realise that we have this acceptance in Jesus Christ, no matter where we're from, Oops. And when you think back, in the early church, all, those, all the sermons recorded in the New Testament, they really have the same basic formula. They talked about the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the need for repentance, and the extension of God's grace to all who will receive him. And you read what Paul, anything he preached, you read the book of Acts, they really are all saying exactly the same thing. The tragedy was how quickly in the early church this concept of grace was actually lost. Um, Augustine, four twin, about, about the 4th century, came from North Africa, Carthage. By the time of Augustine, grace had really been almost... You had to go to church and you had to work and do the right things to get God's acceptance. It was works, not grace. And even though Augustine had a pretty checkered career, <laughs> interesting guy, pagan father, Christian mother, a Christian mother who always kept praying for him. And even before he was converted, he went off to Rome and he was in, in teaching rhetoric in Rome, public speaking. It went quite well until he tried to collect the money that his students owed him and they had all disappeared. So he went up to Milan and uh, while he was at Milan, he actually came in contact with a guy called Ambrose who was the bishop, of, bishop in Milan. And Ambrose, I don't know much about him, but he must have been an incredible preacher. And he preached about God's grace and it touched um, Augustine's heart and eventually, it took him a while, it wasn't overnight, but eventually it won through and it converted Augustine to become a Christian. And it was Augustine who basically came up and started to see the importance of grace. He had a little dip, probably a little different concept of grace to what you and I have. He called it enabling grace, which is not in itself untrue, it is God's grace that enables us to do the right things. That's right. But it's not the doing the right things that puts us right with God. And so he came up with that. Then we go, you know, 16th century, Martin Luther in Germany. <laughs> Interestingly enough, an Augustinian monk <laughs> who actually read some of the things that Augustine had to say. But the two things or two books that really impacted 
on Martin Luther with the books of Galatians and the, books of, and the book of Romans. And it's this guy who's trying to put himself right with God by doing all the right things, beating himself up literally, figuratively, and he can never find that God is accepting. He feels that he can never get accepted by at all to be put right until he comes across and he understands the just shall live by faith. And it's faith that accesses God's grace. And we owe a lot to these two men in our understanding of grace. Our understanding of grace in this church would be almost identical to what Martin Luther revealed and ref set the Reformation going. And we as Protestant Christians, we owe a debt to these guys. And I like this quote from Brennan Manning. He says, Grace is so simple it confounds the wise. Many just don't get it. They either don't believe it or they think we don't need to do anything to receive it. I was just yesterday, you know, I was... I was, I was I get an email from Max Licata, mind you, so do probably 200,000 others every day. <laughs> and uh, I just came across something that he had said. And he said this, the supreme force in salvation is God's grace. And it is so simple because it's just extended freely. And when something is so simple... Often we find it hard to believe. You know, surely we must have something that we need to do and earn this. And we complicate what, has, what is actually one of the simplest things there is, and we put layer upon layer on top of it and make it complicated. Um, I just, I don't usually have my cell phone with me when I'm at the pulpit, but. I just wanted to read something else that Max Carter this morning, I was sitting in the motel, and I read this and I thought, I'm going to read it to them. So he gave me the little quote from yesterday and he says, perhaps the most amazing response to God's gift is our reluctance to accept it. He's talking about grace. We feel better if we earn it. So we create religious hoops and hop through them, making God a trainer and us as pets. And a religious and religion a circus. If only when God smiles and says we are saved, we'd salute him, thank him, and live like those who've just received a gift from the commander in chief. We seldom do that though, to accept grace is to admit failure. We opt to impress God with how good we are rather than confessing how great he is. We dizzy ourselves with doctrine, burden ourselves with rules, we think that God will smile on our efforts but he doesn't. God's smile is not for the healthy hiker who boasts that he made the journey alone. That is, it is instead for the crippled leper who begs God for a back on which to ride. And I think that says it so well about what grace is really about and what our attitude should be. Fine looking man, isn't he? Emperor Franz Joseph, the last Habsburg emperor in Austria. 1916, he died. And uh, he was the last emperor of a very large empire. That's his winter home. You'd be pleased you don't have to do the vacuuming there. That's in Vienna itself, and that's where he lived in the summertime. And being there, stood on the spot where that photo was taken, and what an amazing building. So, Franz Joseph basically had everything. <laughs> He's about as wealthy and as powerful as it was to get in that day and age. But being powerful and wealthy doesn't stop you from dying, unfortunately. And he passed away in 1916. Oops. There's a picture of his funeral procession leaving the Schonbrug. And as all the emperors, the Habsburg emperors, followed the same procession, they all buried in the same Capuchin monastery there in Vienna itself. So the procession found its way to that monastery and to that very door. Inside that door is the crypt where they all are buried. 
And then it says, uh, at the bottom was a great iron door leading to the Habsburg family crypt. Behind the door was the Cardinal Archbishop of Vienna. And this is the officer in charge. He cried out, open, he cried. Who goes there, responded the Cardinal. We bear the remains of his imperial and apostolic majesty, Francis Joseph I, by the grace of God, Emperor of Austria, King of Hungary, Defender of the Faith, and the officer continued to list the Emperor's 37 titles. We know him not, replied the Cardinal. Who goes there? The officer spoke again, this time using a much abbreviated and less ostentatious title reserved for times of expediency. We know him not, the Cardinal said again. Who goes there? The officer tried a third time, stripping the Emperor of all but the humblest of titles. He said, we bear the body of Franz Joseph, our brother, a sinner like us all. At that, the doors swung open and Franz Joseph was admitted. Whether you're the, and there's where his crypt is today, <laughs> And whether you're the most wealthy person, the most powerful person, when we come before God, we're all treated equal. And the great thing about it is God's grace is granted in equal portions to every one of us. Grace is for everyone, the last and the first. No preferential treatment. We, we find that hard, don't we? When we find a good person, we like to treat them probably a little better than we'd like to treat the person that we don't think is deserving of it. But grace treats everybody exactly the same. And you know that. This is what Jesus is teaching when he talks about the parable of the workers in the vineyard. You know, he goes, the, the boss goes down till at six o'clock and hires somebody and they're going to work till six in the evening. He goes at nine and hires another lot, 12, three, he even goes at five o'clock and he hires another lot who only work an hour. How would we pay them? <laughs> We'd say hourly rates, mate. <laughs> You've only been here an hour, so you're only going to get an hour's pay. And I think that's what they, and when Jesus told the story, it's interesting. It's the ones who came at five o'clock who get paid first. And I bet their eyes widened and they were so happy because they got a full day's pay. And I think if you'd been the ones who started at six, might think, well, we're in for a treat today. But they all got paid the same, even those that had laboured all day. And uh, what, he's try what Jesus is saying to us is, you know, we all get the same reward. We all get salvation. Whether we've been a Christian for a long time and done lots of good things, or whether we've been a Christian just for a little bit of time, the thief on the cross didn't really have the opportunity to go out and do a lot to show how much he loved Jesus. And yet he got the same reward as people who had worked long and hard. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you know, when we talk about grace, Jesus, when he gave the Lord's Prayer, he actually gave us an extraordinary clue as to what grace looks like. You remember he'd been away praying himself during the night? He's up and in, up in, uh, around Galilee. And then the disciples come and they say, come and teach us to pray. John has taught his disciples how to pray. You teach us how to pray. And you all know the Lord's Prayer. And it's interesting that it starts, you know, Jesus said, well, when you pray, this is how you should pray. He tells the disciples and he said, and he starts off, our Father... And uh, it's interesting, that in those days would have been an absolutely radical concept. For a Jew to be told that God was like a good father was unbelievable. <laughs> they, you know, they used to get up every morning, every good Jew, and he'd say a prayer and thank God that uh, he wasn't born a Gentile and he wasn't born a woman. So there you go. And uh, he never really thought of God as his father. And then 
Furthermore, in Paul there in Galatians, he says, because we're God's children. God's attitude to us is that we, you are my child and I will take responsibility and care for you. And, and Paul says, and because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. That word Abba, the nearest translation that we have today is Daddy. That's the relationship that God wants us to have with us that we could treat him as our daddy. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, it talks about him and he cries out, Abba, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. What he's actually saying is the, the equivalent of the word daddy. And that's the, how close a relationship God wants to have. His grace extends to us because we are his children. There's another text that John used, I haven't got it here, but he says, I will not leave you fatherless. And the whole concept of that really comes from the Roman idea. When a child was born in, into a Roman house, the child would be brought in and placed at the feet of the father. The father had the right to actually accept that baby or to not accept the baby. And if he didn't accept the baby, that baby would never be part of the family. When Cleopatra had a baby to uh, Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar made a great statement without uttering a word. The little baby was brought in and he could have, politically they thought he, he, he won't accept this child, but he picked up the child and he was just saying to everybody, I recognise this child as my own and he's mine. And I am going, furthermore, I am responsible for this child until the day I die. That's what Jesus is doing, or God is doing for us. He says, I will not leave you fatherless. I'm saying I will pick you up and you will be my child because of the grace that I have and the love that I have for you. He also, Jesus told a lot of stories, didn't he? He told the story uh, of the uh, prodigal son. If you want to know what God's attitude towards us is, you just need to read that story. This rat bag takes away his part of the inheritance, which he really shouldn't have done as a responsible son, goes and squanders it, ends up living with the pigs and he comes home and yet it says, you know, the father had been sitting there, he had been waiting, he had been watching and when he, he says when he was a long way from home, his father saw him, his heart was filled with pity and he ran and threw his sons around his son and he kissed him, welcomed him back. That, that is just sheer grace. And that's Jesus telling us what God's grace is like. The older son, he'd been doing the right thing for all those years. You know, doing, doing the right thing is always doing the right thing. Should we, always, should we do the wrong thing if we have a choice? No. The problem with the older son is he'd been doing the right thing and he thought that was... That is what was going to get him acceptance by the father. It wasn't. The father loved him all the time. You know, I'm here, you're my son, and everything is yours and always has been. We, I think the, in the, into his heart had come that little idea, if I work hard and this rapscallion turns up and now he's going to have a feast put on for him, this is unfair. It's not for us to decide in God's economy what is fair and unfair. God treats us all the same. Grace comes from the personality and character of God. He wants us to accept him as our father. It's about mercy. It's not about fairness. <laughs> if it was about fairness, I think it's Mark Twain has a marvellous saying. He says, if God's salvation was about fairness, your dog would go into the kingdom and you'd be left out. <laughs> And I think that sums it up, you know. If it was about fairness, none of us would go into the kingdom because we're all sinners and there's nothing we can do to actually put ourselves right with God. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift so that no one can boast about it. <laughs> 
If we have some of our own effort involved in our salvation, it won't take very long before we're boasting <laughs> and saying, well, I did this. Or I, and we talked in this morning's, you know, lesson. Um, when treating each other with fairness and not thinking that well, I'm better than the next guy. Grace, God's grace embraces everyone, including the most unlikeliest of people. I just Chuck Colson. I don't know how many of you recognise the name. This guy was a high-priced, hard-nosed lawyer who actually became the chief advisor to Richard Nixon. He earned megabucks. He was good. But this guy was Nixon's hatchet man. <laughs> and you remember Watergate. Some of the older people remember how when Watergate happened. Well, Chuck Colson was the guy right behind that. Grace, he didn't have any. <laughs> he just... Back in those days, it was said, rumoured that he said, I would run over my own grandmother to see Richard Nixon re-elected. You know, and later on in life he said, well, I actually didn't say that, but I wasn't going to let people know I didn't say it because I liked the reputation it gave me at the time. <laughs> That's how hard-nosed he was. And, of course, at Watergate, yeah, he ended up under police supervision there, and there's his actual mug shots and that before they locked him up, charged with uh, breaking and entry and all wiretapping and all those things that went on. And uh, he got a jail sentence. Just before he went to jail, he uh, went to visit a friend who was a Christian. He knew he was going to jail. And he was feeling very, very sorry for himself because here, this very wealthy man with this reputation, and now he knows he's going to go and spend nearly a year in jail. And, he would, he, and this guy read to him from a little bit out of, just a couple of sentences out of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And this is, the, this is what he read to me. He says, pride always means enmity. It is enmity. And not only enmity between man and man, but enmity to God. And when he thought about that, he realised that his problem was pride. And he needed to accept God and the grace that he extended. And so uh, he... That's him speaking later on. Not the, he only died again not too recently. Um, when he went to jail, he started what was called a prison fellowship. That has extended now 114 countries, 1,300 prisons, where the families of the people who are locked up are looked after by this prison fellowship. Grace is extended to the people who are locked up, and Christ, a Christian graciousness is extended in the hope that they will see what they've done wrong and turn their lives around. Chuck Colson's work has turned around literally thousands and thousands of the most hardened criminals out there in the world. And uh, he's written 30 books on Christianity himself. And uh, I just had to share, share this with you. This, this is a little aside, but when I read it, I thought this is priceless. And one of the things Chuck Colson said, he said, I know res the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they'd seen Jesus raised from the dead and then they proclaimed the truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. <laughs> And this is what he says about himself. He said, what motivated me was that my disgrace was not the end of the story or even the main part of the story. The real story was that Christ had reached down to me even in my disgrace and shame and revealed himself to me as the one who forgives and makes new. And that is the power of grace, to stoop down and pick us up and to show us who God really is and make us new. You know, God extends his grace to the most unlikeliest people. All those many years ago in Bethlehem when Samuel was sent out to find the new king, he goes to Jesse's family and Jesse parades all his sons, bar one, 
and they are all good looking, upright young blokes. And Samuel has to ask, have you got any more? Oh, only the youngest, he's out tending the sheep. You know, if you tended sheep in the, in the Jewish economy, you were always unclean. You were richly unclean. You couldn't worship in the synagogue. So he was like the outcast of the family. And yet it's to a shepherd boy in Bethlehem, God had chosen and extended his grace and turned him into the greatest king that Israel ever had. It's on the road to Damascus. Here's this man, if I said to you, you know, God gives you, I want you to write a job description. Who should we get to extend the, the good news of the gospel to the Gentiles? I, I would have picked some guy down in Alexandria, well educated, knows about the, uh, the Greek culture and all that sort of thing. But this guy who is persecuting to put to death the Christians, who is a member of the, of the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee of the highest order, and it's God's grace is extended to this man, and he grabs him on the road to Damascus and says, listen, I've got a new job for you. Unbelievable. We wouldn't, we wouldn't think it was possible. Mary, when she goes and washes Jesus' feet at Simon's feast, you know, if Simon's there, does he know what this woman does? She was at the bottom, and here she is showing her love to Jesus. And Jesus said a very beautiful thing. <clears throat> he says, this story will be told in all the world as a tribute to this, what this lady has done. His grace extended right to this woman to say, doesn't matter what you've done, my grace still comes to you. And you know, grace should change us. If we believe in it and we accept it and it does nothing to us, I don't think we've got the story. It needs to change us into gracious people, more Christ-like in the way that we act with each other, more forgiving, more like him who extends his grace to each one of us so that we can have a, a, a promise of salvation. I love this quote from Max Licata, God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. <laughs> he wants you to be just like Jesus. So grace is not a, a, a get out of jail ticket and go and do what you like. Grace is forgiveness, and there's also the expectation, because grace has reached into your heart, that it will change you and make you more gracious when you go out there mixing with other people in the world. Peter says, you know, grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're often very good at the knowledge part. You know, you talk to some people and you think it was salvation by knowledge. It's actually salvation by faith that accesses grace. And Peter exhorts us and he says, grow in grace. And I think as Christians we need to think about what does that look like? What does it mean to grow, grow in grace? Am I growing in grace? Or am I just the same person I was last week, last year, a decade ago? Because we need to invite God into our hearts and get, let him change us into better people. I came across this in New Plymouth a few weeks ago. I thought this was lovely. It's the New Plymouth Cathedral and here's the sign. This cathedral is a place of grace where you are always welcome. I think we should all put up a, outside all of our churches a sign like that. What do people think of our church? What do they think of the Fongaray church when they come past? Are you, is this a place of grace where you are always welcome? Because we need to make certain our churches are places of grace where people are always welcome and feel they belong. Because if we make it, oh, well, you have to be good to come here, <laughs> and that's what some people think, we're putting a barrier up. We need to say you, everybody is welcome in our churches. And you know, you can lose grace, be like the servant who went in and he owed ten squillion dollars or something to the king. All we know from the amount that is mentioned, it was such a large debt that it didn't matter. When he, even when he begged for time and says, you know, give me time and I'll repay it, the king knew he was never going to repay that debt. It was impossible for him to repay that debt. But he forgives him the debt. And that's what God is doing to us. 
But this guy goes out and grabs the guy who owes him $5 and says, pay me all you owe or I'm going to put you in debtor's prison. And then the king hears about it and goes, well, I extended grace to you. Now it's off to jail for you, mate. <laughs> We're, we've been extended the $10 trillion. <laughs> that's, what, that's what God has given us. So therefore, we need to be sure that when we deal with other people, we are, and the debts that others may owe us are literally, they're the $5 debts. They're not the really important ones, but we need to make certain that we don't try and get hard-nosed about the way they treated us. So therefore, I'm going to treat you quite hard. And we've got to remember that Jesus is the source of all grace. He saved us and called us to be his own people, not because of what we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. He gave us this grace by means of Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but now it has been revealed to us through the coming of our Saviour, Christ Jesus. If you want grace or you want to learn about grace or you want grace extended to you, it's to Jesus that you need to go and ask and he will give it to you very freely. I just want to finish up with a, a little bit from uh, John's Gospel. I put this picture in because I quite like it. Um, according to tradition, you know, John's Gospel we know is the last gospel, last book of the Bible written. John was probably about 90 years of age. And tradition has it, an early church believed that he, the, the scribe that wrote it down for him was Prochorus, who was one of the original seven deacons of the church. I don't know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. And you look at that and you can see, here's Prochorus writing it down, here's John looking back. And of course the eagle is always the symbol of John. He looked, you know, the eagle it is that flies higher than any other, any other creature. It can see further and get the big picture. At the same time it can focus in on the small little things down there. It can see the detail and it can see the bigger picture at the same time. And that's why the, the eagle became the symbol for John, because John's writings, that's basically John, different to the first three Gospels. He's looking back and he can see the big view and he can see the small view. And so there's John with a halo, there's Prochorus with a halo, and here's an eagle with a halo. I don't know, I know John and Prochorus may have been there, but I don't think there was an eagle with a halo there when he wrote his Gospel. But... Uh, I think when we, when we read some of John's gospel, he sums up so much God's attitude to us as sinners. And I just want to read these few words from the beginning of John. And he goes there, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So the word of God became a human being and lived among us. We saw his splendor, the splendor of our Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Indeed, every one of us has shared in his riches. There is grace in our lives because of his grace. For while the law was given by Moses, love and truth came through Jesus Christ. And my prayer for you this morning is that you'll accept the grace that is extended to us, that we'll all see that we're the source of this grace is and we'll make Jesus an integral part of our lives. God bless.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and we are so undeserving of it and yet you are the perfect Father, the one that loves us so much and wants to, us to be with you throughout eternity and help each one of us to accept the gift and to accept that offer of eternal life that you make to each one of us. And I pray that you'll bless this church here in Wangarei. I thank you for their influence in this community and I pray that you'll continue to use this church as a beacon so that many souls will be one to your kingdom, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.